Hello and welcome, I'm your host Greg O'Shea of Talking With Titans. I'm honoured today to be hosting the episode and talking to two Irish rugby stalwarts and two Lions players, but more importantly, father and son. We have Des and Luke Fitzgerald, you're very welcome men. Thanks very much Greg. Cheers Greg. Chatting about uh, Des now, so I kind of did a bit of research on you sir. You had a bit of a, a tougher route coming through your rugby career than, than Luke did. You had to work your whole way through. You were a, a post boy straight after leaving sir, and then you went to Trinity Night Courses while you were playing rugby. You had various jobs and you ended up retiring as the CEO from EBS last year. So congratulations on that. You were always working hard. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was the nature of everybody who played amateur sport. And I suppose the, the one thing you think about on that, Greg, is that the, the opportunity that being a professional gives you is it gives you the absolute best chance to be the best you can possibly be. And that's not really achievable as an amateur. Now, it's not achievable for anyone you're competing against either. So, uh, you know, it's kind of the same for everyone. So you probably still always get the best players, uh, you know, at the top levels. In our day, we had funny ones where we had New Zealanders and on their passport where, you know, you might have said I was the post boy in Texaco or whatever. They had a rugby player and we used to find that really amusing. We didn't really know what it <laughs> meant, but it meant they toured around the world and they guessed it for different clubs and they got their expenses paid and all that kind of stuff. So they probably got an opportunity to do the full time training as well, too. If you can remember back to the days when you, when you were playing, balancing the family life. So you had Luke, who's only a young fella running around the place. Uh, you had your work and you were trying to play international rugby as well. How did you find all that balancing of life? It was challenging. Uh, I was lucky in terms of who I married. My wife worked as well, but we had four kids under the age of four, of which Luke was the eldest uh, wow. at that time. And uh, I was holding down a, a job working for digital, which uh, required an awful lot of travel around the country and international travel as well, too. And they were trying to play uh, rugby in a club and with Leinster and also on the the Irish scene. So it was very demanding. It was a whirlwind life. I'd say it's no different, though, in terms of being a professional, because, you know, the amount of training you do as a professional takes up all your time. It, it's like a job. And it also restricts you enormously in what you can do outside your working hours. But as a general rule, it's a short enough period in your life and it's a very intense period. And, you know, in the modern era, like with social media and all that kind of stuff, it's very hard to have an off day, I'd say. And it's very hard to have a private moment because wherever you go, you're, everybody recognizes you, everybody knows you, and everyone has an opinion on what you're doing as well, too, which I find quite interesting. Luke, what do you think of professional rugby and, and social media and dealing with all that side of it? Was it quite hard to do while you were navigating through your career? Yeah, it was, you know, and they were kind of learning as we went along. Um, you know, we my first tour was to to Argentina in 2007 in the summer, and there was no real camera phones. There was guys who weren't playing the last test match who, you know, they went out for for drinks nearly every night of the week. They had a great bit of crack, which is what the old tours used to be. That doesn't really happen anymore. You know, I'm thinking of some of the instances at the world at the World Cup. I think it makes it challenging from from a professional sports person's, uh, you know, viewpoint. I think it makes, you know, they're, they're under, you know, very intense scrutiny all the time. As Des said, it's very hard to get a private moment. Of course, there are benefits. And Greg, you'll be well aware of that. But all the opportunities that it is presented, it certainly does that. And it gives supporters great access into what, you know, loads of interesting parts of sports people's lives, like how they're training, how they're recovering, you know, what they're doing, you know, on, are, are they like normal people? Generally, they are which also means they make mistakes. So I think people find that hard to, to remember at times and they can be very quick to be very judgmental. So I think yeah. it's a toxic enough environment at times, but if it can work for you in certain respects. You obviously had a great career and unfortunately you had to call it early day because of a medical advice because of your neck. It was a abrupt finish for you and then it had to go into working life. And, and how did you find that? So the transition is very difficult for lots of people, unless you're lucky, unless you've you know invested in something or you've got something else to go into. Generally speaking, you've got to go in at the bottom rung. Like I went in as an intern somewhere. And that, yeah. that's challenging. That's challenging. Like you go from, a, you know, you, you go from a media scrum where there's 60 journalists listening to you and really kind of, you know, engaging with you and trying to, you know, figure out what you're talking about in, in a rugby context and then you go to another place where she was completely on, on, on the other foot and you've got to you know make a start it probably supercharges you in other respects so you have all this exposure you got to deal with the media that's something most people will never do unless they get to the upper echelons in business it gives you great discipline it gives you great resilience to deal with i suppose criticized in, in, in the media being criticized by coaches you know, getting dropped from a team, all these great things that seem awful at the time, but really equip, equip you well for, for a career 
after your rugby. So while it's really challenging for the first couple of years, I think they make you really purpose built to have a great career afterwards as well. Des, you worked all the way up to being the CEO of EBS. So how do you feel it is for young players finishing their rugby career than having to start a full work life? The good thing about work is that, you know, most companies, there's so many people involved and there's so many opportunities and it's a much, much larger world. You don't have to be like a professional rugby player where you're absolutely the top or you don't get picked. You know, there's jobs for everybody. So it's how far you go is up to yourself in terms of your knowledge, your capacity, your willingness to work. And, you know, you don't have to have any brilliant skills. Like if you want to play on the wing, you got to be able to do the 100 and well under 11 seconds. If you want to be managing director of a company, you just have to know the business very well. you got to work really hard and you got to work your way up to it. And you got to have an intellect as well, too. But, you know, you, you'll have what you have and you can make the most of it. But like there's a defining factor if you want to play on the wing. If you can't run that fast, you're not going to be playing. No matter how hard you work, <laughs> he, he's just not going to make it. You know, there's yeah. 10 of those guys who can't do under 11 seconds, so they're never getting picked. I've heard you've kept up your fitness since since retiring. You, you cycle a good bit, and I hear you can bait out more presses than Luke. Actually, that wouldn't be hard. That's not, <laughs> he, I was going to he, say. He's, he's the bank. <laughs> no claim to fame. <laughs> and Luke, have you managed to keep up the training even though you've, you've finished playing, or did you kind of just sail straight into business life? So I kind of kept reasonably fit when I, when I finished originally, just because... You know, with the injury that I got, you know, with the, the nerve damage in my arm, as soon as I could kind of train again, I needed to actually get use of my arm again because I was kind of more my shoulder area, really. Um, so I had to actually do different things just to get it back to, you know, being able to function, to be able to sit at a desk, to be kind of comfortable. So there was that part of it. But I started a master's um, in 2018 and I really let it slip. And it was a massive, massive mistake. But I'm 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 on the way to, to getting it back. I made sure I kind of surrounded myself, you know, with smarter people in college for my assignments. I think that's just fairly cute, isn't it? Most people try to <laughs> you're the dummy in the class, find the uh, find the smart guys with the runners. I have a few friends who are really into running, like really good runners, and they've kind of brought me along the curve. And and I always think if you can do that in life, surround yourself with people who are kind of ahead of you to help you chase and bring up bring yourself up the curve. Um, that's been a big help to me. Yes, we'll go to you first. Just generally, how do you feel the Six Nations campaign went for Ireland? Any highs, any lows? <laughs> My God, there was plenty of both. I mean, yeah. any year you beat England's a great year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's, nearly, that's nearly all always enough on its own. I think this year, you know, we could have beaten Wales. Uh, it was closer. I think France were the better team when we played them. I still think we could have beaten them. So we could be looking at an entirely different year uh, with um, a couple of decisions and a couple of, uh, you know, Nearly was us, you know. But I think if you look overall, you see Wales scored 20 tries in the championship. We scored 12. That tells you something on its own. You know, so our capacity to, to finish and our, our capacity to utilise the opportunities we had wasn't strong. You know, Sexton was way up there with the kicking well ahead of everyone else in terms of points scored in the championship. So I, I think those statistics are telling enough. Now, we also conceded the least amount, which is interesting as well, too. But, you know, I, I think uh, I'd be saying at this point is OK, you know, OK of a result this year because we've become used to better ones. I think we have some work on from us. They're pretty clear. I think the pack of forwards is good. Uh, I think we've got some challenges out in the back line. Look, the real concerning part is probably the ageing part with um, our best back, which is still Johnny Sexton. I thought he was brilliant whenever he was on the pitch and it was brilliant to see him finish the last three games of the championship, you know, all, all 80 minutes. Uh, on, under his belt. I thought he was brilliant throughout. I'd agree with a lot of what Des said. If there was no red card against Wales, if there was kind of that bad 15-minute patch uh, against against France hadn't happened, um, you know, and it almost very nearly happened against Scotland, by the way, we kind of dug ourselves out of a grave on that one. Um, you know, things could look very, very different, but they did happen. And they happened fairly consistently. They happened in kind of three matches because even against Wales, for large periods, we were the better team. We had these 10 or 15 minute kind of lulls in our mentality where we kind of went to sleep and our defence was very, very poor. I think if they can fix those things, I think Ireland will be in a good place. At the start of the championship, I picked them to be Grand Slam champions. Uh, I thought they'd beat everyone because I thought England at the end of the championship would be tired and I thought they'd beat France at home. Um, so I was disappointed with the performances, but I think there's enough there and they have the quality to be, uh, you know, you know, challenging and to be winning championships. So I think it's all is not lost in that front, but a few bits to figure out still. But Des, speaking about other teams now in the Six Nations, the French seem to got their mojo back. Wales obviously won it. Scotland beat France 
and beat England, which is just unheard of. If you put money on that before the Six Nations, you're a rich man. So do you think the competitiveness of the Six Nations is better than ever, except for Italy, obviously? Yeah, well, I think you have to allow for the fact that England were very poor. And I think a lot of that goes down to the Saracens guys, which is the kind of the engine of that team, not having a competitive rugby in terms of preparation for the internationals. France have always had an ability to play ball. I think they're primed in terms of some absolutely fantastic players. You know, they got a couple of two, two great out halves, as far as I can see, that are top class players. They've got this guy at scrum half Dupont, who to me looks like a world class player. Uh, and generally, France are never short of big mamas to play in the forwards. So they'll always be able to get you ball. You know, there's always a capacity for them to have guys yellow carded at, at just a moment you don't need it. You know, and they just don't seem to be able to get past that. So I think the big work on for them is their discipline, uh, you know, and sticking with their game plan. And, uh, you know, I think they've got the players to execute. I definitely do. I think they, they'll be a force, I think, in the World Cup if they get that discipline sorted out. Luke. What do you think Italy's role is in the Six Nations at this stage? Yeah, it's, it's a tricky question, Greg, if I'm being honest. I love having them in there. Rome was always a great fixture. They were tough matches, but at the same time, there was lots of days where we beat them badly, particularly when you're on the back of. So in the Six Nations, obviously, you've got five games, but there's two games together and two games together. If you got them on the second week of either of those windows, particularly at the end of the, of the championship, you were ba- you know, if you didn't put a score on them, you were disappointed. Yeah. In terms of a future... It's not sustainable if it goes on like this and they don't win any games. In relation to the England team then, Luke, do you think their dominance is gone and Eddie Jones's term is up? I don't think so yet. Uh, I think he's worth sticking with. I think he's very good, generally. Uh, he's also a great value. Uh, I do enjoy listening to his interviews. I thought defensively against Ireland, they never got out of the traps. Uh, that was unusual. I thought their discipline was poor throughout the championship. There's things that I think are very fixable for them. And they'll have guys coming back in that I think will give a better balance to the team. Uh, and I think they become formidable fairly quickly again. So, no, I don't think it's time for Eddie, Eddie Jones to go. Uh, I think he does need to pick the right team, particularly in that key area. Um, but I think they'll be really good next year. CJ Stander, he got the send-off that he deserves after his commitment to Ireland. And now there's a new South African being signed to Munster. Uh, Jenkins, I think his name is. And there's a bit of an uproar about how many South Africans are coming in and how many foreign players are coming in playing for our provinces and, and giving away spaces that could go to our homegrown players. I know Luke stands now. What do you think there's of all that stuff? I can understand it a little bit more at club level, but I would be more in favour of distributing our own players around and giving them the experience of playing at different levels. But I would think like what we need to see happen is we need to see bigger investment and support going into Munster to develop more players at club and at schools. Uh, you know, they have less schools than Leinster, so you probably have to put more into the clubs. But I think generally putting more into the clubs to generate more players is the way forward. And I'd be prepared to wait time to get our investment right rather than to be taking in other guys who basically stop some of our players. Like if someone is fantastically better, significantly better than any option we have and we're stuck in a place, you know, where we've maybe 13 players and we need 15 that are of a certain standard and you can bring in someone like that. I get that at, uh, say, club level, at Leinster level or Munster level or whatever. But I don't think that's the case at Ireland. I don't think there's any need for that and I don't see any value in it. And, uh, you know, I just wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be in favour of that policy. And yeah. I'm delighted it's kind of almost been killed now with the five-year rule. I heard you mention in, in your podcast, The Left Wing, that even though you have the opinion that we don't need these foreign players coming in, we have the Irish growth here. There's still players like Rocky Elsom and Jim Williams and East Nisewa. Do you still think there's room for those world-class guys to come in? I 100% think that there's value there. Look, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all here, right? But Leinster before this period had a very, very difficult year or two. So just after Matt O'Connor left, they blooded so many young guys. And there was a period of pain that you have to go through. Loads of those guys are now key members of this all-beating squad. I think Munster people have to be, you know, they, you know, they need to figure out if they have the guys. I believe they do have them in place and they need opportunities. I think it might, you know, might cost them a year or two. It might be a difficult year or two. But I think in the long term, I'd rather see them get the opportunity. And I believe if they are given the opportunity with the right coaching in place, a la, you know, Leo Cullen, Felipe Contepomi, Stuart Lancaster, they can flourish. They can become great players. They need the exposure. So my worry is that from a Munster perspective, they miss out all these guys. They don't give them opportunities. 
to, to actually make the mistakes amongst and, and also have good players around them while they're making the mistakes. Joe Schmidt was always brilliant at that. He did, didn't introduce, you know, 10 guys from the academy at the same time against Treviso. He usually, you know, had three or four along with some very experienced campaigners, along with, you know, the examples that you use, your Rocky Elsons, your Doug Howlett down in Leinster, your, you know, mm-hmm. Issa Nassiva, all these kind of guys. That's where those people have a really good role because they bring up the standards in training when all the internationals aren't there. They bring up the expectations of the of what you're producing in the matches when, when guys aren't around. And that's probably something, you know, with the Irish team, the quality would dip quite substantially because we just don't have the player pool. So they have a role to play. I don't think on a national level they do. I think we have enough quality there to, to not need that. You know, the Munster didn't get 06 and 08 in one year. There was built up, you know, from, from years and years of getting opportunities and different learnings. So I think they need to take the chances, Greg. And that's probably, um, you know, I think they might be making a mistake there. So I don't want to see them do that because I think we need Munster to be strong. Both E played in the Lions tours against South Africa. Des, I go to you first. Can you give me an insight into your experience? I don't think you actually ended up going to South Africa with the Lions team. There was the apartheid at the time, was there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the, the tour was cancelled. So I was hoping like hell these guys weren't going to have the same experience. It, it's a very tough place to go on tour. Like on average, the Lions will win one out of every three matches down there. That's an, that's the history of it. So it's it's not an easy one. There's only eight games to play. So it's very hard to get your combinations right. This is going to be a particularly tough tour because of the fact that there's so few matches to prepare the test side. And if you lose your first match down there, you're, you know, you're, you've got a, a Sisyphean challenge down pushing a rock up the hill after that. You've got to win the first game. Otherwise, I'd say nearly virtually impossible to win the series. Luke experienced it firsthand. You played in South Africa. And how did, was your Lions experience? It's an amazing challenge. Uh, it's something that I'll never forget. And the South African public, the atmosphere down there, everywhere we went in 2009 was electric. They loved their rugby. They love the Lions matches. I have vivid memories before the match of coming into the stadium. And obviously we'd lost the first test, so I got into the second test. Um, and they always play that match at, at altitude um, to try and really blow you out. And they like it's just so like because it's usually obviously the key decider. It's either to keep them in the theory in this in a series or to close it out. And I just remember coming into the stadium, a little bit of sunlight. They all had the brides outside. And, you know, South African people, they're just, they're big people as well. They're all with the beer. They're throwing beers at the bus. They're kind of (laughs) doing, kind of, you know, I'm I'm making a gesture. They're kind of doing the old, uh, you know, hand across the neck. They're kind of saying, we're going to absolutely mill you out there. And straight away, you were kind of felt like, right, we're going into war here. Um, No matter how pumped up we were after Willie John McBride's speech, giving out the jerseys. (laughs) <laughs> I'm saying, geez, this is really like it really is that I, I you know, uh, it's a different environment to the hotel. So it was a brilliant experience. It was sad that we lost it because it would have been great to have a third test, um, you know, to 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 you know, winner takes all. But I'll never forget. I mean, even at halftime, it was the worst change room I've ever seen just for injuries. There was guys splayed out. There was guys getting shoulders put back in. Um, guys just coming awake. I know that's nothing to, to laugh about or anything. Like it's obviously very serious, but. It yeah. was just bodies on the line stuff everywhere. And it was an amazing, amazing time. And I think the guys, as you said earlier on, it's great that we have something to watch, but it's great for the guys involved to have it because to miss out an Alliance tour for people who are, you know, really peaking at this time and playing great rugby and would have focused all of their training for the tour, it would have been heartbreaking. So Des, staying on the Lions topic, do you think uh, there's any Irish players besides Johnny Sexton who have booked their plane ticket uh, probably Robbie Henshaw comes to mind, but anyone else you think? Oh, yeah. Uh, Ty Furlong's definitely gone, unless he's auditioning for a river dance or something like that. But he, <laughs> he's definitely gone. I'm going to give you a springer. I, I think that um, Andrew Porter is going to go too. There's nothing about South Africa other than that it is an enormous physical challenge. And he's he's a guy who's built for that kind of stuff. Uh, he's an enormously strong fella. I think he's done very well. Uh, he's had a, a great season in terms of filling in a lot of the time for a furlong over the last year. So he's got plenty of experience. He's a hardy boy. And I think he's going to get picked. I think James Ryan, assuming he's back to play and all that kind of stuff, he'll get picked. Um, and I think that um, Ty Burns in with a shout as a utility, uh, you know, middle five player. Atoja is going to be the main man there in the second row. He'd be the first guy in the sheet. It's going to be exciting to see. And I agree with you in the Porter point. I can see him getting in. I remember rooming with Andrew Porter for under 20s and I remember asking him, I was like, man, how are you so big? Like, it's crazy. We're both 19 years old. I played against his father. His father was a 17 stone centre. 17 stone centre? For old Wesley. Now, the average big guy in the centre in those days was 13 and a half stone. 
Oh my God. So he was quick and he was big. He was a fellow who could arm wrestle with the front row as well in the bar afterwards. The genetics were there in terms of construction. That's it. The genetics were just there waiting to be waking yeah. up. Luke. Do you think there will be a good mix of nations in the Lions Tour or who do you think will dominate it? I think there is going to be a mix. I think what's probably the most surprising part is that the English component are under serious pressure to get in the team now. They didn't play well throughout the whole championship. And there was I would have had you know loads of shoe-ins. Like Sinclair went on the last trip, he probably goes again. But I didn't think he, he looked like he was very poor. It's Hoje who looked like a cert. And I agree with Des on his day. He absolutely should be. He's under pressure now. Like he has to, he's one of those guys who'll have to play well in those matches, like really, really well in two or three matches before the tests start. Otherwise, I don't think he gets in. I think, I think Alan Wynne Jones had an unbelievable Six Nations. He's a leader. I think he'll probably be the captain on the tour. And I think um, Barrel is another guy who you would have had 100% starting at 10, but they played him at 12 out of position and he didn't have a good championship either. But this is the great thing about the Lions. So many great players to pick from and who they're going to, you know, who's going to be the bolter to get on the trip in the squad? Who's going to play well in the first five or six matches to get into the test? This is what makes it so intriguing. Main thing about the Springboks is the physicality. We all saw the World Cup, uh, the, the Rising Sun documentary, just how much they care about being physical and being big. Des, do you think the four nations that make up the Lions even have the players to deal with the physicality of the South Africans? I think what you got to do is match them. And then you got to turn the tables on them. So if this gets to be a stand-up bash, bash, bash match, they're going to win it, no matter who we pick, in my view. But I think once you can start moving them around the field, once you've got the hands and once you play the game at a pace that really puts them under pressure, I think you've got a good chance. So I don't think you've got to win the physical battle. I think that you can, if you hold your own the scrums, there's a possibility you can dominate at the line out, depending on what you pick in terms of combinations. Right? So I think you can probably do that. Yeah, and I think once you're winning ball and you're able to play with that ball, I think you can really make a difference there. But you're going to have to get beyond a down and dirty uh, wrestle. You're not going to win that. We talk about lines till the cows come home, <laughs> the three of us. Um, I, think, uh, I think we should, we, should, we should round this up. And I think a good way to round it up is Des picks the forward pack. Luke, you pick the back line. And uh, I'll give my own thoughts on the back line. Des, you have to pick a Number one, Mako Vinopola. Number two, Ken Owens. Three, Furlong. Four, Atoji. Five, Ryan. Six, Sam Underhill, who's not wow. playing at the moment, but I think he'd be okay. Tom Curry and Toby Falato. That's who I think Gatlin will pick. I'm going with Murray, Sexton at 10. And Luke won't like this, but I'm putting Farrell at 12. I'm putting Henshaw at 13. Zamet on the wing, Hogg at full back, and Williams on the other wing. That's my back line. I think Murray. I think Sexton. I think Tulagi. But well, Johnny Davies, I think, in 13, even though North has been very, very good, I think Johnny May. I think Liam Williams is built for a trip like this. Having Hogg for his kicking game at altitude will be really key. It's a close call between Sexton and Farrell, but Sexton had a better Six Nations and his kicking was, was brilliant. I agree with all that, really. I think they're, he's going to go with some uh, people he can trust, and that's where you're getting your Murrays and your Sextons and your Hogs and people like that. But uh, lads, I've had a great chat. Uh, thanks a million for joining me. Uh, I really appreciate your insights and expertise and taking the time to, to have the chat. I hope everyone watching at home has enjoyed it too. That's all for me. Keep well, stay safe, and catch you next time. Cheers, Greg. Thanks right. a lot. See nice you. Meet you. Cheers. See you.